Thank you very much, and thank you for being here. I have to start with an apology. I don't, last year I couldn't make it. I gave a talk via Zoom. I hope that you weren't there, Tobias. I know that you were. So maybe I'm apologizing mainly to you. A lot of this will be a repetition of what uh, I uh, spoke about in that uh, talk. Hopefully you forgot, Tobias. So, <laughs> and um, apology number one. And apology number two, because of various issues that I'll, I'll speak of some of them in the, as I go along, the data collection for the project was much delayed beyond our uh, initial estimates. So data is still coming in today and tomorrow and uh, the day after, just for a few more days. It will be done by the end of July. If not, we'll just stop it. So I don't really have the data at the end because I have some of it just to show you some very crude descriptive at the very end, but I don't have the bottom line, which is the data. If you're interested, feel free to contact me in a few weeks. My email will be there at the end of the talk. And, uh, one of the team members will present this work at the end of August, so by then we'll have a lot of, uh, so it'll be much more developed uh, results part, which will be pra practically absent from this talk. Just a word about the team. Myself, Jonathan, and Shaul are the, the core members. We wrote a proposal. It's uh, based on, on our joint work, mainly the work by myself and Shaul, and Jonathan is the cross-cultural work. And Jonas is the postdoc that joined us and did most of the legwork for the project, and even joined at some point mainly for the his uh, expertise in uh, modeling and econometrics. And it's a bit embarrassing now that it's so homogeneous gender-wise, this group, but uh, it is what it is. Um, okay, this should work. Okay, the, it, the project builds on, on three papers. One, as I said, by myself and Shao, the one on top, I'll talk about this one in a, a bit of detail in the, in the first part. and then on another two papers that both of them, Jonathan Schulz, the third uh, core member was involved in. Um, both of these are cross-cultural studies. This one is not a cross-cultural one. And in essence, the idea is to take this, the ideas from this paper here and do it in a cross-cultural setting. Okay, we've had this idea since the paper was published in 2015, that it, the notion that it would be interesting to check these things in many different countries. And uh, the Honesty Project was a uh, uh, a very good uh, opportunity to do it, to get the funding for it and the support. In that sense, it was a relatively easy uh, proposal to write because we knew what we wanted to do. And so that's the, the nice part. The, diff the not so nice part is that actually doing it was much more complicated than we anticipated on many levels. And uh, that's why we're partially why we're so late with the data collection. Okay, but it will be okay, we have the data. Okay, so a bit on this first project first, uh, at the beginning. Okay, the starting point is that we as human beings are, on some define it as an ultra-social species. We're unique in our capacity to cooperate in large groups with, uh, without a genetic relationship. And I think our closest competitors, when you think about the scope of cooperation, is uh, our... Um, social ants and, uh, and the like, okay? We also, relative to what we could, we like to tell the truth in many instances. We have some a preference for truth telling and in some uh, meta-analysis, this is one. There's another one that looks at a lot of behavioral economic works where people can lie in order to get more money basically or get more things that they like. They don't do that as much as you would expect if they were completely uh, not averse to, to lying. Okay. And a lot of these kind of, the, uh, the work that this meta-analysis uh, builds on is variations about this kind of setting where a person goes to a lab, receives a, a dye in a cup, rolls it, peeks, see the, sees the result, and reports the result, and gets paid according to the report. And importantly, only that person, it's quite obvious, knows the actual report. So there's it's easy to lie because nobody else can know what the actual result was unless you think it, uh, the dye itself is hinged with some, uh, uh, some fancy uh, electronics. Okay. Okay. So there's the um, basic, finding, basic finding that people don't lie that much, but in this particular paradigm that I'll describe in a moment, people lie much more. That's the interesting result from uh, from the paper by myself and Shaul from uh, 2015. What we did was uh, as follows, people came to the lab in pairs, 
They didn't come in pairs. They came in large groups and they were paired. So it's player A and player B are a pair. Each one has a die in a cup in their cubicle. Player A rolls the die and reports, for example, that he or she rolled a five. Okay. Player B sees the report and then does the same thing herself. Rolls and reports and says that she reports, in this case, also a five. In this case, both of them earn five euros. It was done in Germany at the time. Okay. But they earn the five euros only if their reports match. Okay. If player one says that he rolled a five and player two rolled a two, then they both earn nothing. Okay? So they have a clear incentive to coordinate dishonestly uh, in order to increase their profits, right? If they don't lie, they will make a profit in one out of six trials, right? Because that's the probability of matching. And if they want to increase their profits even more, player A should report higher numbers, right? Because and player B should report whatever player A reports if they want to increase their profits as much as possible. This is what should happen in a situation like this if everybody was truthful. Okay, this is player A, this is player B, and anything can happen with equal probability. If they are dishonest, what do you expect would happen? You feel free, by the way, to, to bother me and interfere and ask questions as I go along, I think. I won't be pressed for time at the end, and it's fine to have some questions as I go, please. Oh, no, I just... Okay, so it's, it's not difficult to, to see that if they lie, you expect to find a concentration of outcomes on the diagonal, right? Because that's where the profits are, and in particular, the high ones, right? Because the, there the profits are higher. And that's indeed what we found. This is the actual data from 20 <laughs> participants many times. And it's overwhelmingly the amount that they lie in this situation, and very different qualitatively from other results in the behavioral um, ethics, these kind of lying experiments. So they should earn money one out of six. They do so more than 80% of the time, actually, these people. And it's been replicated in two labs. So it's quite robust. Okay. What actually happens, just to give you a taste of the, of the type of interaction, so this is one particular dyad that played this thing repeatedly for 20 rounds, the same two people. Okay. So player A reports a six, and then player B reports a six as well. That's a nice trial. It's reasonable. There's a non negligible chance of this happening, right? One out of 36 cases, you should get a double six. Round number two, again a six and again a six. This is really not... Uh, one out of, Benny, how much? Okay, very unlikely. And this is practically, cannot happen, <laughs> right? That uh, people will report 20 times in a row, uh, six and this other play was a match. And still it happened, as I'll show you in a moment, a non-negligible amount of time. So it's not just one diet. Okay. Another thing that can happen is that player one, for example, reports a six and player two matches, player B, okay? And in this case, it seems that player one is very consistent and dishonest, and player B seems to be honest, right? Can also happen, doesn't happen that much. Okay, well, the opposite can happen as well, right? Player A seems to be honest, but player B always matches what player A does. Also, it doesn't happen that often, but it doesn't happen. This is all real data from the experiments. Okay. Okay, this is also, the probability is zero. It's for player B to match 20 times in a row. It's really tiny. It cannot happen. Okay, something nice that happens as long as we're, just to give a taste, and this is somewhat anecdotal. In one particular dyad, the first player reported a four. Player A, player B reported a four as well. And they had this nice roll of fours. And this, can anyone guess what might happen after a while? Or who feels frustrated between A and B? Okay, so, B gets yeah, right, because B is clearly willing to watch whatever A is uh, reporting, but A is not reporting the maximum. Why not? Maybe A wants to feel that he's not a complete, total <laughs> dishonest person, doesn't go for a six, so player B at some point <laughs> reports a six, and this, I think, is a clear signal of what player A should do. Does player A get it? So, somewhat, <laughs> and, and that's the end. Okay. And you can see, find a lot of these, this is the, the nicest one, but many dynamics can, can occur during this uh, repeated interaction. Okay. We had in that experiment 20 dyads in this particular treatment. There were others, I won't mention all of them. So these are some of these you saw. In five of them, it was just sixes all the way. In one more, A was honest and B was uh, always matched. Okay, so in all of these six, B always matched, right? And in uh, 
for more, A was very close to reporting the maximum. So not always sixes, but always some combination of uh, five or sixes with uh, one four. Or over here, almost everything sixes. And in these cases that are marked in green, B all also always matched what B reported. Altogether, 50% of the B players here, which in, in a obvious sense are the central players in this kind of interaction because they are the ones who determine whether the, a particular round is successful in the sense that they earn money uh, or not. So 50% of them were brazen. That is, they just reported whatever A reported the whole time. Okay. And hard to find exceptionally honest people. Okay, that, that on the face of it are just reporting the truth. Not that they don't exist, but uh, especially for the B players, it's hard to find. Very few of them. Okay. This is just one treatment in an experiment. Usually, always you need to compare a treatment to something else. And the main comparison is to a similar setting in an individual uh, situation where the same player rolls a die, reports the result, and then rolls the die again and reports the result. And it's paid only if the reports match. So it's very similar to the collaborative one, but it's just one person behaving by, uh, by him or herself. And just focus on these two. The, uh, this one on the left is the, what I just told you about. It's called aligned outcomes because the outcomes are identical. And this one is the individual here. And there's a huge difference, right? The individuals, when they play this interaction by, not interaction, in the setting by themselves, they, are, they lie much less. They match much less than they do when they are matched with another player. So that's the main indication that the collaborative setting pushes people towards dishonesty. It allows them to be dishonest, okay? Forget about all these results. If you're interested, ask me for the paper, and I'll, I'll be happy to discuss or send it to you. Okay, and the main uh, take home for that paper is that in a situation where to be cooperative, to collaborate with another person, necessarily means that you're dishonest, many people are willing to be dishonest, as if these two things are tradable, right? I'll be co cooperative so I can be more dishonest than I would if I did not have the, this cooperation aspect of the, of the interaction. And that's the idea uh, of the moral currency uh, terminology that we're using. Okay, that morality can be a currency and you can exchange one type of morality for another. So the collaborative aspects gives you a license if you want to be dishonest. Okay. I think I'll skip this just in the interest of time to get to the, uh, to the current project. Okay, this is some stylized results from a meta-analysis using this paradigm or very similar paradigms. Okay, and what's common to all the papers including, included in this meta-analysis, and of course in our paper as well, is that they were all conducted in what's called the weird countries, which are the Western educated, industrialized, rich, democratic countries. Okay, so no, country, no, uh, no experiments or data points in, uh, in Africa and the Far East and, uh, and so on, South America. Okay, and that's the main motivation for the project. Okay, to, to see what changes, if anything, in other places, in, in other countries. And the background for that is two papers by Jonathan Schultz. In one of them, they looked at uh, intrinsic at honesty. Basically, they did a, a simple die rolling experiment where you just roll the die and earn whatever the die, whatever you report in many countries. And they found a variation. And that, that variation is uh, related to what they call the PRV, the prever preference, prevalence of rule violations in the countries, which is uh, some composite, composite uh, index of uh, a few measures. And, um, Okay, so we can see here the different countries and this uh, prevalence of rule violations here and the mean claim that people uh, ask for in the die rolling thing and you see the, the positive relationship. So result number one, the dishonesty is sensitive to cultural variation. And also in another paper that Jonathan, uh, by Jonathan, they find evidence that um, impersonally uh, impersonal cooperation. The willingness to cooperate with other people is also, also differs in different countries. And I won't go into details, it's a very interesting paper, so I recommend it a lot. Okay. But obviously the basic setting that is, involves corruption and cooperation is related to these two because they, the, these two papers show that both corruption and cooperation vary 
cross-culturally, so obviously corrupt collaboration may vary as well, but it's really not trivial to determine in which direction and exactly how. Okay, so the current project, we want to look at societal variation in honesty and cooperation. Um, okay, we want to look at, at the end of societal, societal variation and corrupt collaboration and what we're interested in and uh, the paradigm that I showed you before. Okay, I'm just skipping a few things uh, to get to the interesting things. Okay, and the basic idea is to collect data in, uh, in many countries, in 20 countries we had at the end, and, uh, and to look at corrupt collaboration and at the various other measures and to see how, how they vary. Okay. What might we find in such a, an exercise? Suppose that we go to 20 countries and each one measure individual dishonesty and also um, some, some sort of uh, collaborative dishonesty. Here it's dyadic, honesty or dishonesty. Right. According to the results that I showed you before, we should find more dishonesty in the collaborative setting. But it's interesting to see if the difference will be constant across countries or will it vary in different countries, and in particular, will it vary according to particular characteristics of the different countries? So that's the very generally the kind of results that we will be looking for. Okay, I'll show you the list of countries in a moment. Um, okay. Now I want to talk a little bit about the methodology, how we measure the the main things that we measure in the in the project. So one thing we want to do is measure cooperation. How cooperative is a person? Okay. We also want to measure individual dishonesty. And we also want to measure collaborative dishonesty. Okay. I'll talk uh, briefly about each one. How to measure cooperation? We use the uh, regular version of a public good game. It's a four-person public good game. This is more or less the instructions of a snippet from the instructions that people read in the experiment. So you were grouped together with three other participants to form a group of four. Each of you receives a personal initial budget of six points. Each of you can choose how much of this initial budget to contribute to a group project. The individual contributions of the four group members are added up, doubled, and evenly divided among all members. I skip a bit. Your share of the group project is added to the amount that you made in your personal initial, initial budget to determine your overall final payment. This was followed by an example, quite detailed, and uh, and then they had to make their choice. How much do they want to contribute out of their six points to the, to the project? Um, maybe some of you are familiar with this kind of game. Uh, uh, important characteristic is that regardless of what other people do, it's in the individual interest to not contribute anything. Right? Because whatever you contribute is doubled and divided by four. So if I contribute a point, personally, I receive only half a point back from that contribution, regardless of what the other people in the group do. So there's a dominant strategy of non-contribution. I'll tell you in a little, I'll show you in a little bit. Participants find this hard to grasp, and this was one problem that we had in the, in the experiment. Measuring individual dishonesty is relatively straightforward, but there is a challenge of the, the study was obviously done online in the multiple countries, not in the lab. So we, it's not trivial how to measure, how to find a substitute for a die rolling paradigm um, when the experiment is done online. One thing is to have them report the outcome of a virtual die roll. There are multiple websites that will roll a die for you and report the result. Okay, we weren't so happy with that because we were afraid that they will be suspicious that we can actually know the result, okay, that we direct them to a particular website. We can ask them to roll an actual die, but then we also didn't feel comfortable that they will really do it, right? Maybe not everybody has a die or won't bother to actually roll it. So what we ended up doing is a mental guessing task where you have a task like this, please choose a cell and memorize its position. Please do so, memorize, just mem choose one cell and memorize its position. I chose the fifth one, for example, and then report the number that appeared in the cell that you chose. Okay, so I should report six. Good for me, right, if I chose uh, cell number five. And statistically, this is identical to a die rolling uh, task, and, but, and obviously it has the good, um, trait that uh, it's completely private information, right? Because it's all inside the participant's head. So we use this kind of task to measure individual dishonesty as an alternative to the die rolling task, to measure individual dishonesty. Measuring collaborative dishonesty is even more complicated in an online setting, um, okay? Ideally, we would have an interactive, um, interactive interaction where 
in a live setting, one person will report one thing, the other will respond, and it will go back and forth for as many rounds as we want. We didn't feel that that's feasible with the type of participants we will have and the relatively little control that we have over the participants and when exactly they're recruited. We're using a survey company to get the participants in, in all the countries. And it wasn't likely that they will be able to guarantee that enough participants will be online at the same time to be able to engage in an interactive uh, interaction. Okay, that's point number one. Another solution could be to be dishonest about it and to lie, to tell people that they're a match with another person and to have that be a fictitious player. We had a talk here earlier today about uh, deceiving participants. We did want to do that. Uh, not so much because we feel like we're particularly honest, but uh, in economics you cannot publish if you, if you're, if you deceive. And some of uh, people, uh, the members of the team are uh, economists, experimental economists, so it's really not, not an option. So what we ended up doing is what we thought, think is a pragmatic, pragmatic solution. We have first movers, player A, and second movers. We had first movers make three individual choices as follows. First, choose a cell and memorize its position, but only with three options to limit the amount of options. That's the first choice. The second choice is contingent on possible choices or responses by the second mover. So for example, for the second choice, suppose that in the previous rounds you reported four, and that would be the actual number that they reported, and your partner reported two. Now do the whole task again and report whatever the, the outcome is. And they did this three times when this two was replaced with four and six. Okay, the numbers could be two, four, and six in this situation. And then for the third round, they did that basically again, but this time nine times, because there are nine different contingencies for the third round, three for the second, and then times three for the third. So basically, the first movers make choices for all of the possible things that can happen in th those three rounds, contingent on the second movers' responses to their own uh, reports. Note that at the end, we're not so interested in the first movers. This is all done to provide an authentic experience to second movers where they will be able to report something and receive feedback that's based on their report. And it will be really based on their report because they're a match with a strategy provided by an actual first mover. Okay. So, and then we had a, a host of other measures that I won't go into. So it's a relatively long questionnaire and a lot of things to look at. But those are the main three, measuring cooperation, individual dishonesty, and collaborative dishonesty. Fine. Okay. So just I want to, de to describe a few of the issues that we had that uh, at the end delayed the data collection a lot. Um, just to, to tell the history of the project and also maybe you can learn something from that. So one thing that took a lot of time is the design of the collaborative uh, dishonesty measure. We had a lot of variations until we settled on the one that I showed you before that kind of balances the experience that the participant has and the uh, feasibility with uh, the limitations of the, of the participant, uh, of the panels that we, we were using. Another issue is that it was really difficult to, to write down the pre-registration, in particular the hypotheses part, because it's better, I guess, as a rule to have directional hypotheses in the pre-registration. It's more credible. But it was really hard at this project to form hypotheses that we were comfortable with. Because, roughly speaking, if you want corrupt collaboration involves, you need to be corrupt, but you also need to be collaborative. And those two things don't go together according to what we know. So it's really hard to form uh, an intelligent um, prediction on what will happen in a country that's very corrupt, but also um, typically not very cooperative. So at the end, it's more exploratory, the way the pre-registration is written. But we, had, we were going back and forth on the team for a long time to, uh, to nail this down. I, I, hope it, I hope it's reasonable at the end, but it took a lot of time, much more than anticipated. One, you can think of it as a setback, a strange thing that happened along the way, maybe half a year ago, a bit more. We wanted to do a small study just to get a feel for the type of data that we'll have. So we, we had a plan to do a four-country study with the US, India, Hong Kong, I know it's not a country, and Nigeria using MTurk participants. In all of these, we can um, use English, right? There are enough English-speaking uh, people in, the, in these countries. MTurk says that they have data from all these countries. In practice, there was no data from Hong Kong and Nigeria, just nobody answered. 
So not practical. From India, there is data, but Qualtrics, the software, the platform that we're using for the questionnaires, gives you IP addresses and geolocation data. And it turns out that almost all of the India data was from one particular building or block somewhere in Mumbai. Okay, so clearly data that you cannot uh, uh, treat with. So the four country study, which we'd be happy to do and thought it would give us a, a good run in preparation for the main study was useless. It was a one country study at the end. We had a, a huge problem. This is really relatively recently after a lot of setbacks with, uh, with the public good game. In the pre-registration, we said explicitly that we, we will explain the public good and, and we'll have a control question or two control questions. And if people fail the control questions twice, they will be excluded from the study. And after the first uh, wave of data came in, almost everybody failed the control questions on the public good. So we just couldn't go on like this because there was practically no data. So we had to revise the way we explained the situation, revise the control question. We made them extremely simple. It was essentially a binary question that you have to answer, get, uh, answer correctly in two trials. So you see it's very easy, right? Because there are only two options and you have two trials. Still many people got it wrong. And then we understood that these people are just not paying attention. A lot of the people in some countries more than others. So we, we talked with uh, Toluna, the company that, uh, the survey company, we had to move these questions to the very beginning and use these control questions as a screening question. This was done after, already after all the translations were implemented into Qualtrics. So we had 20 languages, almost some repeated thing, but nearly 20 languages for first movers, 20 languages for second movers, and then every change involved changing all of these 40 questionnaires. It was a lot of work, and it work that we had to do in languages that we don't speak anymore. That we don't speak, not anymore, we still don't speak. <laughs> we never spoke them, okay? Um, Okay, at the end, it's, uh, we, we managed, and, and just, just really just recently, uh, maybe two weeks ago, after we started finally uh, what we thought would be the last wave of uh, data collection, we, we found in some countries, mainly the African countries and Pakistan, and also in the sample provided by Toluna. Uh, there are multiple duplicate IP addresses that seem to be linked. Uh, for example, the Kenyan sample had multiple uh, duplicate ID addresses that all were from Dubai which is very suspicious and essentially means that we cannot use this data. So this was a whole issue, a lot of communication with the company with a lot of time pressure because we know that we have to collect the data by the end of July, but everything has been dealt with and it's okay. Okay, so now I'm wondering, at least for me, I'm not sure if this delayed the project, but the past six months, I'm not, some of you are surely familiar with uh, what's going on in Israel. It's a crazy time to be in Israel. Uh, I've been to countless demonstrations and rallies uh, over the proposed set of legislation that's proposed by the, by the new government, and it's a huge distraction. It's really hard to focus on anything in a, in a time like this, not only for me, for many Israelis. I'll skip some of the pictures and the details in the interest of time, <laughs> but just to say that's a demonstration. There were was, there was some nights that over half a million people were out on the streets in Israel. In the U.S., that would be equivalent to upwards of 15 million. Okay, we only have 10 million in the country. Not even. That's my uh, partner wife and that I, I uh, drew that sign. So that's my contribution to the protest. Okay. They said that they want the signs in English so that the media can pick them up. So <laughs> I, I don't know. Okay. So I got, okay. So now as we're standing now, it's very near the end of July where we should end the data collection. We have most of the data. We committed in the pre-registration to collect 50 participants, 50 first mover participants in each country. Those are those small, the red line over here. And 450 second mover participants. That's the main data that we're interested in. That's the blue line over here. And here you see all the countries, Brazil, China, Colombia, Javier, okay. You're responsible for these guys over here, okay. <laughs> uh, Germany and so on. Okay, so for first movers, we're kind of okay, see? on almost all countries. This is after some scrutiny and some uh, quality checks. Second movers, some countries are okay, others will be okay. The US, for example, won't be a problem because it's going on now and it's re relatively fast. The ones we're concerned about is Kenya, Nigeria, and Pakistan. It's going very slowly in those countries. So there I, I can't guarantee that the, these blue bars will be high enough to be included in the sample in, in a week. Uh, Morocco will probably be okay, according to the... Okay, but overall we'll have the data. 
Okay, we, we have it already for most of the countries, and for the few that we don't have, we'll probably have it in a, really in a matter of days because um, I, I prepared this data this morning. It was already different from the, the, uh, the way it was yesterday because uh, it's, uh, it's running as we speak. Um, okay, so just how high my time was? So about? Okay, okay. Yeah, so I just 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 show you some crude descriptives only for first movers. They didn't have time to analyze the second movers because they were coming in, in the, in the in the last days. Okay, so thinking about the first measure, cooperation. How much points people contribute to the public good, in the first measure. So this is obviously shorter the quarter of the contribution. So in Nigeria they contribute the least, in Pakistan the most, and. Okay, Javier, I'll, I'll just, because you're here from Colombia, so it's, uh, it's nice to point out that uh, the Colombians are contributing nicely, cooperative people are relatively, so well done. <laughs> Israel is uh, in the middle somewhere, the U.S. as well. Okay. If, if you're a representative of another country, feel free to speak up and, uh, and claim your uh, <laughs> whatever you deserve. Okay. So the nice thing with that is that there's some variation. Okay, that's important, that there's some variation. Then we can check if, if and what it's related to this variation. Okay, looking at the individual dishonesty measure, where you have to just pick one box out of six boxes and say whatever number appeared in that box. There's less variation, but also some. The red line is what you expect if people were honest. Right? You expect the average to be 3.5. In a few countries, it's around that, but all of these, starting from Israel and above, are statistically significantly more than the 3.5 that you would expect. You can look at this kind of data in a with some more resolution. If you look, for example, just for example, at Pakistan, on the one on the left, the distribution of reports between one and six. So the black bar, the darkest one, is how many, the proportion of people who reported that they rolled a one. Okay, and the white one on the right is the proportion of people who reported a six, and all the rest are in the middle. Okay, so in Italy, for example, people really like to report six, <laughs> right? And this is actually the case for most countries. Okay, the ones on the left where people are relatively honest here are the exception. Right, so in, in Pakistan, and this is, should be taken with a grain of salt because we have relatively few, less than 50 participants in, uh, I think, in Pakistan here. So people dislike six, also five and four, they like three for some reason. In Japan, it's a bit strange. They seem to like one and six the most. Okay, but, but I'm not sure that these kind of observations are, uh, have merit. We'll have to look at the second mover data. We'll have the same results with uh, 10 times as much, uh, nine times as much uh, participants, it will be much more interesting to look at. But it's nice to hear that there is variation. That's it? Oh no, I had some more. Oh, okay. I thought I had another type of result. Okay, but that's it. So that's what I have to tell you now. In a week I would have had much more to say, in two weeks even more. And so if you're interested, please feel free to contact me in, uh, in the coming days, weeks, and I'll be happy to share the results as they come in come in and are analyzed. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the talk. I found that really interesting. Um, just uh, one question on something that seems to, I'm not a psychologist, that probably come clear once I make my question, but when you're doing the kind of pre-checks for who's going to, like, whose data is going to be included in the study, is there a worry, given that you're kind of specifically trying to test for honesty, that some of the checks, in order to get people to take part in the study, might actually be ruling out some of the more dishonest people, so people that will lie about where they're actually based and kind of using different IP addresses, or people that will lie about how much attention they're actually paying yeah. for the That's a really good question. Stuff. And because we want worry that actually, yeah. if you let everyone in, the more dishonest people aren't even getting through the door. So, Whatever yeah. results you get, maybe there was even more dishonesty. Like that. That's an excellent question that, that we explicitly discussed among ourselves as we were doing this. So a really dishonest, one indication of dishonesty is, for example, using a false uh, IP address yeah. and maybe doing an experiment without reading the instructions, right? Just doing it as quickly as possible so you can move on to the next task you have and, and make some more money. It's true that maybe the most dishonest people are these people. But they're useless for us because they're not responding to the task that we have, right? We ha th their data is not interpretable, however you mentioned that, pronounce that word. And it's, it's a real concern. Also, 
after they failed uh, some of the control questions, we try, we try to emphasize in the instruction that you have to get this right if you want to proceed. And we're afraid that these kind of emphases direct them towards honesty. Right? That you have to really be careful and be good and be correct. And not just maybe not behave naturally as they would. And this is a real tension that we have. I don't have a proper, just, I'm just saying that the question is really good and it's a concern. But in this kind of experiment, people have to understand, the, have to read the instructions. If not, they're worthless to us. We just can't have them. So at least, I hope, across all countries, we have people who pass our, our checks, and then we compare those. So there is something common to the different samples. I hope that the most dishonest people are similarly excluded from our experiment in all countries. I'm not sure that that's the case. Yeah, some uh, countries have a higher percentage, but really dishonest people on the kind of extreme end, they're not even getting in the study. Like yeah. that, that might not be equal across. Could be. And in and, and any kind of data collection, there's also a question of who actually gets to be in the panel, right? Because this uh, company, Taluna, it's an international survey company, has panels in multiple countries, but it's not obvious, or it's even obviously not the case that the characteristics of the panel are identical across countries, even if they're representative. It's really complicated, these issues, and it's a really good question, but we don't have a better, in my opinion, uh, solution, way to go about this kind of cross-cultural, uh, these kind of questions, maybe some other, if it's a field study, maybe it's, could be better. You know maybe that uh, lost wallet experiment where people drop wallets with money all around the world in different cities and check how many people will return that. Field studies are nice that way, right? Because it's a field study. Everybody can participate. I mean, but this is not a field study, so we have these kind of uh, issues. Okay, thank you. Okay. Thanks, that was really interesting. Um, are you familiar with all of the Kyrie's Moralities Corporation? Say again? Are you familiar with all of the Kyrie's theory of morality as corporation? No. Okay. Um, but it may, I sympathize with it. Yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm predicting it's going to be like the big successor to Hype Troll Foundation. These sort of argument that like basically all of our moral norms and tendencies um, can be thought of as deriving from kind of mixed mode public goods games. So ways of stabilizing corporation, but just over different time scales and different plays and different payoffs and things. And so this is a very minor point. It doesn't you know, affect any of your results. But when you're describing the behavior here as corporation, there's a sense in which uh, that might be misleading because the people who are being dishonest, arguably they're cooperating with the other person, right? So maybe there's a norm of reciprocity or they're being loyal to the other person. And if that's still moral, it arguably still counts as cooperation to stop cooperating with the... the, the right, so I would call it corrupt collaboration or cooperation. So it's a form of co cooperation. But I agree that it's cooperation as well. But that's why we have the di different measures. We, have, yeah. we measure each one separately. Hopefully they capture something uh, different. Yeah, yeah. yeah. that's a better thing. It was just kind of the terminology. Yeah. But it might still be considered yeah, corporate. No, it is. It, yeah, yeah. For sure it is. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yeah, I'm still, I am also a little interested in this uh, notion of swapping of honesty as a moral currency for collaboration. Um, excuse me, as a clarifying question first, and then a subsequent, more substantive question. Um, when you mean the swapping, of, and, and I'm not familiar with this moral currency language, but does it mean they both participants in general take honesty to be good, and so it's a moral currency, but there's the second moral currency, which is cooperation, and um, given the monetary incentive, we'll just switch these out. These are both equally. They can't, you can't have both in this setting, so you have to choose between one, choose one. You can't have, you could have one. Oh, okay, I see what you're saying. You can't be both honest and cooperative in the setting. Right, right, under right, the circumstances, right. Um, okay, so, so, but... Maybe my question is something like, um, why take this to be a theory about swapping out of various incompatible goods and just a more similar, familiar kind of like groupthink story or a story about like persons like, uh, are more likely to be dishonest when there's something that they can gain if they're uh, as a sense of like a diminished or shared responsibility with a partner. I guess we could go in that direction as, as well. Just following the first paper, uh, we thought about this, this idea of, of moral currencies that are tradable, and in particular the two currencies that, that we're interested in, that uh, dishonesty and, uh, not honesty and, uh, and cooperation. 
but uh, it makes sense your suggestion. I think we can also frame it differently and, and, ask, and have a similar setup. Okay, but we can still think about that when we write the paper and everything. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay, well, please everyone join me in thanking our speaker. Okay. Thank you.